Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's so good to see so many of you in the house today. And thank you, every one of you, for joining us online today. We are so grateful that you joined us today and that you're part of what God is doing here at Avalon Church. I was thinking about this. A little over 20 years ago, God led me to go on a fast. I went on a 40-day fast, nothing but liquids, for 40 days. I was just trying to find out what God's will was for me. Some of these guys you saw on the, the screen were very good friends of mine. I traveled with them all across the world, literally. And we preached the gospel in churches all across the world. And it was very exciting to see what God was doing. But I knew that God was changing, not just my heart, but what he wanted me to do. And uh, a direct result of that fast was that we started Avalon Church. And I believe that was God's will for my life. And since that time, in 20 years, I just want to recognize a few people and just say thank you to a few people, uh, to all of you really, for your sacrifice, for your giving. Um, but did you know that in 20 years, we've seen over 2,300 people give their life to Jesus Christ in our services? We've seen over 1,600, 1,600 people that got baptized here at Avalon Church. If you were one of those people, you can clap. Uh, if you were one of those people, if you got saved or baptized at Avalon Church over the last 20 years, would you stand at this time? I just want to see all those in the room today. God bless you guys. Isn't that amazing? What a wonderful, wonderful thing. Thank you so much. And uh, we just believe that God is going to do much more over the next 20 years. Let me say this. None of this happens without sacrifice. None of this happens without commitment. And uh, God gets the glory, obviously, for everything that has happened here. But uh, so do you because of your commitment, because of your giving, because of your serving. And uh, it is just such a wonderful, wonderful thing to experience what God has done in this place. I just want to recognize a couple of people. If you were uh, part of our team that started Avalon Church, and I know several of you are here today, but if there were only 19 adults, but if you were part of the team that started Avalon Church, would you stand? We want to recognize you, all of those of you in the room, Vicki. Justin, you need to be standing. Justin, all right. Uh, Neil and Bonnie, Brad Webster, so good to see Brad and many of you today. Uh, just thank you so much for your commitment. I, I said when we started that, and I wish this was original with me, but it wasn't. I stole it from somebody else. Um, but I told our people, they thought it was me, they thought I was very clever. Um, I told them, I said, look, we want to be judged not by our seating capacity, but by our sending capacity. And did you know that God has called from us so many people that are serving in the ministry? Many of, some are on our staff even today. Uh, we've helped start 43 churches around the world. Let's celebrate that. That's a wonderful thing. Literally tens of thousands of people coming to know Christ because of that. Uh, but we've had uh, a lot of people that have served, and there are some that are friends in the house today. Uh, so if you are currently on our staff, or if you were formerly on our staff, and you're here today, would you stand? Uh, we just want to celebrate you. Just stand all over the room. We're not, we're not going to get mad at anybody. Let me, let me just say this. You guys remain standing for just a minute, and I hope I don't miss anybody because I can't see everybody, but uh, of the people that have been raised up from within this house that have served on our staff. Patrick here in the back. Patrick was one of the, uh, he started out just as a little kid and he grew up uh, in this place. Charles, uh, one of the, uh, actually you and Casey were the first people that were married in this building. And uh, Charles served on our staff. Uh, Louise, and look, it's so, I'm so glad uh, for your service here. And Katie, both of them were in the house. They were members of this church, and God uh, just selected them, and they began to serve here in this place. Justin uh, was just a teenager when, he start, when we started this church, and he began to serve. And uh, uh, Jonathan, we hired him from without, without side, so he doesn't count. All right, so 
And then Dusty over here uh, within the house there. And I can't see who's standing in the corner, but uh, so glad. So you guys be seated. Did I miss anybody? I don't think I did. Uh, I want to say this. There's one other person I'd like to thank. And uh, even though he was not on our staff as a paid person, he did serve because you guys just don't know how much of a struggle it was in the beginning. There was a time. Some of you remember this. There was a time that I was the worship pastor here at this church as well as the senior pastor. Don't clap. That was not a good day. And uh, Lee and Rhonda, they started coming here uh, many years ago. And uh, Lee heard me uh, lead worship for a Sunday or two. And he's like, that's all I can take. So Lee and Rhonda, would you guys stand? Thank you for being in the house with us today. Their daughter, 16 years old as well, uh, born 16 years ago. So I do math. There you go. So thank you guys for being here with us today. And all of those of you that have served in the various areas in our church, we want you to know that we love you. We thank God for you. We would not be where we are today without you. And so many of you just served in such important, important roles. Let me, let me just recognize one more group. If you were married while you were here at Avalon Church, if you were married while you were a member of Avalon Church, would you stand? All those that were married, uh, let's give all these folks a hand as well. Dean and Norris over here, the very first couple that got married. And I don't think the first couple that got baptized at our church is here today, uh, but we are certainly thankful for all of those of you that have been saved and baptized or married here at Avalon Church. What a blessing. Let's give all of them a hand one more time. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so excited about what God has done here in the past and what he is going to do in the future as well. Well, we've been talking out of the book of Joshua, and we've been talking about how God will take the setbacks in your life and turn them into comebacks. God is just known for doing that kind of stuff. He's a God of second chances. He's a God that will allow us, even though we may have blown it before, he'll allow us to get back in the game and serve him. And I'm so glad that he does that, and I'm so glad for a God of second chances. So today we're going to we're going to ask this question, are you asking the right questions? Are you asking the right questions in life? Whenever you face a battle, are you asking the right questions or are you asking the wrong questions? Now, we know that children ask questions. They ask why a lot. How many have kids? You know what I'm talking about. They'll drive you insane with their questions sometimes. Well, that's just a, uh, an indication that they're intelligent. Um, they ask us questions sometimes that we don't know the answer to. Or sometimes they ask us questions that we dread, like where do babies come from? That's always a big one. Uh, I hear some young kids in the room today, and they might be asking your uh, advice today after the service. If so, you're welcome. All right, so sometimes they stump us with their questions. When I was little and I saw the television, I asked my mom, how do they get all those people in that little bitty box? And I still don't know the answer to that question, but uh, the fact is they ask us lots of questions, and questions are good. We have a friend in Florida that uh, years ago, their child was about four years old, a little girl, and um, th she asked her mom, where does Jesus live? And her mom was so excited about that question. She was showing interest in God, interest in Jesus, and uh, so she kind of gave a, maybe too deep of an answer uh, for a four-year-old. She, uh, she looked at her daughter and she said, honey, I'm so glad that you asked that question. The Bible tells us that Jesus died for our sins and he was buried, but he came back to life. And today he is sitting on the right hand of God. And that little girl looked at her. She goes, ooh, I bet that hurts. 
The fact is, questions are important. Um, but we've got to learn to ask the right questions. The reason that some people get frustrated in life is not because God gives them the wrong answers, but they're asking the wrong questions. And today we're going to read a passage of Scripture uh, out of the book of Joshua. And just so you'll know, I'll catch you up to speed. The Israelites had been delivered from slavery in Egypt. They sinned because of their unbelief, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses died, and Joshua was the new leader. He was getting ready to take them into the promised land, the land that God had promised them before. Abraham, hundreds of years earlier, God had given them a promise that they were going to go into a land that God was going to deliver them. So they were on the verge of fighting their very first battle. They were going to fight the battle of Jericho. And so as you can imagine, Joshua being the leader that he was, he was trying to dot all the I's and cross all the T's, make sure that every possible contingency was covered. When all of a sudden, he saw a man that was not one of their soldiers that was holding a sword. Now, if you're getting ready to go into a battle, back then, especially when you fought with swords, and you saw a guy that you didn't recognize, you're going to do what Joshua did and go up and confront him. So let's begin reading in Joshua chapter 5 and verse number 13. It says, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Are you on my side or are you on their side? Are you for me or are you for the bad guys? Are you here to help or are you here to hinder? Why are you here? Why do you have a sword in your hand? I want you to notice the answer that this person gave. And he said, no. Isn't that a great answer? Are you for us or for them? No. Wait. Um, I know that I ask my wife questions like that, and she doesn't give me a straight answer, but you're a soldier. You've got a sword in your hand. Are you for us or are you for them? And he said, no. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord, and now I have come. Uh, it, it could be translated this way. The, the meaning of it is this. I have now come as the commander of God's armies. Hey, you with a sword in your hand, are you on my side or their side? No, but I have come to take over. I have come as the commander of the armies of the Lord. And then notice what Joshua did. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped. And said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? By the way, did you notice the way that he changed his question? The first question was kind of selfish. It's all about me. Hey, are you on my side or their side? Are you a Republican or a Democrat? Oh, no, I didn't just say that. I'm sorry about that. Are you for wearing a mask or not for wearing a mask? I didn't say that either. You just to to delete that out. Are you for us or them? Are you conservative or liberal? Whose side are you on? No. But I have come as the commander of the armies of the Lord. No, but I have come to rescue you. By the way, Joshua didn't recognize him at that moment. But as we're going to see, this was actually Jesus Christ himself. It was an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. And the reason we know that is because what happened next, when he fell down and worshiped, everywhere in the Bible, whenever a person began to worship an angel, they said, stop, don't worship me, only worship God. But here he received his worship. And if you read in the next chapter, he spoke as God. You know why? Because he was. There are many times throughout the Old Testament that Jesus appeared He appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Hagar, to Leah, to Rachel, to Moses, to Joshua, to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to Gideon. And here he is appearing 
as God himself, as an Old Testament pre-incarnation of Jesus Christ. Are you for me or them? Are you on my side or their side? Wrong question. Wrong question. Always leads to an answer, but you don't understand it if you ask the wrong question. God, are you for me or are you for them? Are you on my side? And God's not really interested in taking sides. What he is interested in is you getting on his side. God's not going to choose a team like a playground fight. But he will invite you to be a part of his team, and he will fight the battle for you. Notice how he changed the question. Are you for us or for them? But then he says, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place that you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. I just want to give you three thoughts, and it won't be very long. You know that that's probably not true, but nevertheless, I'm going to say it anyway to give you comfort. Uh, Some of you are thinking about the banana pudding that we're going to have afterwards, and uh, I don't blame you for that. I'm thinking about it too, but I'll keep this as short as I can, okay? Here's the first thought. God is not upset when you ask questions. A lot of people think that God gets upset when you ask questions, but did you know that he does not get upset when we ask questions? In fact, the Bible is filled with people that ask questions of God. The book of Job, uh, Job asked questions the entire time. God, why am I suffering? You ever ask God that question? Why did I lose my job? Why did my mom get cancer? Why did my dad die so young? Why did my child get kicked out of school? Because they're stupid? No, never let it. God doesn't say that. Job asked about suffering. Moses asked, God, why did you give me this job to do? I don't like these people that you have given me to lead. I, I'm upset, God. You ever, you ever get upset or question God about the assignment that he gives you? Um, Gideon asked God about his calling. Some of you may doubt your calling. Job asked about suffering. David asked where God was in his time of trouble. In fact, read the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is filled with David asking God the question, where are you when things are going wrong? Where are you when things are tough? God doesn't get upset at our questions. Elijah asked questions when he was tired. He began to doubt God's love for him when he was tired. And by the way, so do we. Sometimes the reason that you begin to doubt God or sometimes the reason that you begin to question God is simply because you're tired. You need to relax. You need to take a vacation. You need to get some rest. You need to let go of the things that you're holding on to. Jesus lovingly took questions from his disciples and from others. You may not know why. Why am I suffering? Why do I have this disease? Why did my loved ones abandon me? Why did I experience this loss? But I can tell you that the cross tells us, you may not have the answer, but when Jesus died on the cross, it tells us whatever we're going through is not. It is not God abandoning you because Jesus took our abandonment when he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? And there he was on the cross and he suffered abandonment so that we would never be alone, so that we would never be abandoned. You may wonder why you have uh, suffered pain and Jesus suffered pain for you. You may wonder why it feels like that you're all alone, but it is not because God doesn't love you. Because God proved his love on the cross. It it proves that God has a plan for us. That God will never abandon us. Jesus suffered our judgment, our abandonment, our pain, and he proved God's love for us. So I want you to understand this. God is never, ever upset when you ask questions. But we've got to learn to ask the right questions because if we don't, we'll get an answer to the question we didn't ask. Because sometimes when I ask God, why am I suffering? 
Well, we can get the technical answer because there's sin in the world. Because, But yeah, God, but I didn't deserve this, did I? God, I, I didn't deserve what I'm going through right now. In fact, I've been going to church. I've been doing a good thing, God. I've been getting a gold star because I was doing so good. I was doing all the things you said, and here I am suffering. Why? Why? Well, sometimes that's the wrong question. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Wrong questions are often rooted in wrong motives. See, once again, the fact is that when we ask God a question rooted in the kind of idea that Joshua asked, you know what he asked? Remind you, are you for us or them? Are you on my side or their side? Whose team are you on, God? You on Team Richie or not? And often our questions are rooted in selfishness. Because obviously we don't want to suffer. We want to know why God is punishing us or why he's been so hard on us. Or we ask why or why me or why now or why this or why were you not there, God, when I was going through those painful moments? Why didn't you stop that? Why cancer? Why my child? Why my job? Why are people being left behind and abandoned in Afghanistan? You know, often we ask God these questions and because he is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-loving, we don't understand. And how could we? Because we don't see what he sees. We don't know what he knows. I would encourage you to watch, go on YouTube and watch the documentary, Sheep Among Wolves. Sheep Among Wolves. I watched this recently. And did you know that the greatest move of God in the world today is happening in Muslim countries. Did you know that? In fact, throughout history, more people have responded to the gospel during suffering than any other time. And we look on the news and we see, well, there are people abandoned in Afghanistan, or there are people that are left behind, or if we pull out, there are going to be all these Christians that are going to suffer. And that may be true. But did you know that in the Muslim world right now that people are abandoning Islam in Afghanistan, in Iran, in other countries? Listen to this. By not the hundreds, not the hundreds of thousands, but by the millions. Literally abandoning Islam and are turning to Jesus Christ. In the Muslim world today, there are literally millions and millions of people that are coming to Jesus Christ. It's the fastest growing church in the world. And political commentators have said, you know, Iran is the greatest enemy of Israel. Iran has the power to demolish Israel. Iran is their greatest enemy. And if you watch this video documentary, you'll note that the people there that are being saved, they acknowledge, yes, that at one time, We were their greatest enemy, but they believe with all of their heart that God is going to use the people of Iran that have come to Jesus Christ to win Israel to Christ. Isn't that amazing? And look, the fact is, we often ask the wrong questions. And sometimes they're rooted in the wrong motive. And I'm not, once again, I'm not suggesting you should not ask questions of God. You should. But often what happens to us is that we seek answers when we should be seeking a person, Jesus Christ. And I can tell you this, no matter what your suffering, no matter what your pain, no matter what your doubt, no matter what your loss, if you'll seek the person of Jesus Christ, rather than just simple answers to your questions, you will always receive the answer that you're looking for. And so what should we do during our times of trouble? Well, we should do like Joshua. And yeah, he asked, are you for us or them? He asked that question, really the wrong question. But then he asked the right question. How do you ask the right question? Well, this brings me to my third point. Worshiping Jesus 
leads us to the right questions. Worshiping God will lead you to the right questions. Don't you find it interesting how Jesus answered Joshua's question? Are you for us or them? You on my side or their side? You on my team or their team? And I love how Jesus answers. He says, nope, but I have come as the commander of God's armies. And I love the fact that when we begin to worship him, that he will begin to show us the right answers. You see, that's what happened to Joshua. Uh, Before he knew who Jesus was, before he began to worship him, you know what he did? He was asking the wrong question. He was asking stuff about him. He was asking out of selfish motive. Now, I'm not suggesting that he was wrong. I mean, yeah, if you're getting ready to fight a battle and you see a dude with a weapon, you want to know whose side he's on, right? But when he began to see who Jesus was, when he began to worship God, his question changed from, are you for me or for them? And it changed to, what do you have to say to your servant? And that, my friend, is the right question. No matter what you're going through, God, what are you saying to me? God, what are you trying to teach me? God, what are you trying to do in me? You see, God is not interested in taking sides like a playground fight, but he is here to take control. And I said this a couple of weeks ago. God is always in control, but he will not take control in your life until you surrender to him. You see, the fact is we want God to be in control most of the time. When we're facing a battle, when we've got a big enemy, when we face a mountain of debt, when we're facing cancer, when we're facing a problem physically, when we're facing a divorce, when we're facing family problems, we want God to step in. We want God to change them. We want God to change the circumstances. Make no mistake, God is always in control. But he doesn't always take control because he loves you too much. He will not force you to worship him. He will not force you to obey him. He will not force you to do anything. And when we say to God, are you on my side? God, I thought you were on my side. God, I've become a Christian. I got baptized. They talk about next steps of the church there all the time. And I started doing that. Became a member. Started serving. Started giving. God, why is this happening to me now? And that's the wrong question. God, are you on my side? I signed up for Team Jesus and it doesn't seem like you're showing up. Are you on my side or theirs? Are you on my team or the other team? But when we we begin to see Jesus for who he is and we begin to worship him like the God that he is, then the question changes. It goes from, are you on my team or theirs, to, God, what are you saying to me? I, I know that during this pandemic, there have been a lot of Christians that have quit going to church. Did you know that nationwide in America, over third, a third, over 30% of all Christians have stopped going to church. I'm not talking about joining online. I'm not talking about just coming occasionally because they're sick. I'm talking about over one third of believers have stopped going to church. And, and they're asking God the wrong question. Look, the fact is God did not design you to do life alone. And, and you will never love church as much as you do whenever you stop going to church for yourself and start going to make a difference in somebody else's life. You see, when you're just about you, God, are you for me or for them? God, are you on my side or their side? God, I'm, I'm trying to find a church that I enjoy, that I like their programs, that I like their music, that the pastor doesn't preach too long. 
that I kind of agree with. They kind of make me feel good. I get the warm fuzzies when I go. I don't ever feel guilty. Wrong question. Whenever I stop living life for me and I start living it for someone else, it changes everything. Let me just show you proof from that. Uh, Kim and I, before we were married, I mean, before we had kids, we were married. Um, whenever we wanted to go somewhere, you know what we did? We got in the car and went. We didn't make an hour plan. We didn't get together a diaper bag. We said, hey, you want to go to the movies? Yeah. All right, I'll meet you in the car. And we went. Hey, you want to go out and eat? Yeah, let's go. And we got in the car and we went. You know why? And I'm not suggesting that we didn't have purpose in our marriage. We did. But it was all about us. We went where we want. We did what we wanted. When we wanted. And we didn't think anything else about it. But we had three children. Our oldest daughter, Brittany, sitting here on the front. And... I know that she'd probably be mad at me for pointing her out. She doesn't like to be pointed out. But when we had that child, when we had that baby, we stopped living for ourselves. And we started living for somebody else. And I'm not suggesting that it didn't change our schedule, because it did. I'm not suggesting that we hopped in the car and went wherever we wanted all the time, because we did not. I mean, you know as well as I do, when it takes two hours and three outfits because they pooped all over themselves, every time you try to get in the car, sometimes you're just like, oh, quit it. I, I'm done. We'll just stay home. We'll order pizza. Right? And, and when we started living for someone else, it changed our schedule. It changed how we spent our money. It changed everything about us. But you know, I would not trade that for the world. Who we became, what we discovered because of our children was life-changing. And if I had a choice to go back, not in a thousand years, would I ever go back. You know why? Because we started living our lives for someone else. And there's some of you, you you're trying to find the perfect church, and it, I've got bad news, it doesn't exist. That's why we say Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. That's why when people say, I don't like organized religion, I say, well, you'll love Avalon. We're very disorganized. <laughs> but whenever you begin to discover that you can be a part of God's purpose, and you don't have to move to Afghanistan as a missionary to do it, you can start serving right where you are. And every Sunday, you're making a difference and you begin to live not life for yourself, and you stop asking the wrong questions, and you start asking the right questions, only then will you discover how much fun church really is. I've been to South Africa about 10 times, and every time I've been over there, we've gone on safari. One thing I noticed about some of these little antelopes there, there's this one kind of antelope over there. They, they're, it looks like on their rear end, it looks like an M. And, and Bob Graham, our missionary over there, he said the reason is they are the McDonald's for everything else in the savannah. Just about every predator will feast on those little tiny deer, those little antelopes. You know what I discovered, though? A lion does not attack herd. Never have. A lion will not attack buffalo or antelope or kudu or any other thing when they're in a group. You know what they do? Whenever the little silly springbok begins to kind of hop over by itself and he leaves the safety of the herd and he's like, man, man, man. he's eating over here thinking that everything's going to be cool. And all of a sudden the lion has him around the throat. You know why they do that? Because they left the herd. And, and do you know that you're open to attack when you're doing life alone as a Christian? There's safety in the herd. There's safety in the church. That's the way God has designed it. 
And I hope you'll discover that. You see, whenever I begin to ask the right question, God, what are you saying to your servant? I know some of you don't know this. Uh, you don't know why I'm limping like I am. But my condition was, I went to Mayo Clinic. Long story. But a little over a year ago, I began to limp. I didn't know what was wrong with me. And for those of you that have been part of this church, you know that um, about nine, ten months ago, I was in bed just about 24 hours a day. Couldn't Did that for two months. Moved up to a wheelchair, moved up to a walker, moved up to a cane. And now... I'm not completely better, but I am getting there. The doctors think I'll make a full recovery. And I got to be honest with you. At first, I was asking the wrong question. God, why? And I played the game that some of you have played. We've all done it. God, I have not served you. Don't I deserve better than this? This is the way you're going to treat me after all the sacrifices I've made in my life. Can you imagine talking about the sacrifices you've made to the Son of God? (laughs) Oh, yeah, I know a little bit about sacrifice, son. But I began to have my heart turn toward God. And suddenly I stopped asking the wrong questions. And I started asking God, what are you saying to me? What are you trying to teach me, God? What are you trying to do in my life, God? And you know what? And I believe that I'm going to have 100% healing. And I have people all over the world praying for that. And what I was diagnosed with was peripheral neuropathy and radiculopathy. I don't know what that is. It sounds ridiculous to me. Radiculopathy. I at first thought they made it up and were playing a joke on me, but they said that's a real thing. And I paid tens of thousands of dollars to get the answer of, well, we're not really sure what you've got. (laughs) But when I began to ask God, what are you trying to say to me? How do you get glory from my suffering? How do you get glory from my pain? I believe that God began to give me the answer that caused me to worship him more. And I'll just let you in on what I believe God said to me. Two things. Number one that he was going to heal me and that he was going to get glory for this. And he was trying to increase my faith and the faith of our church. And I'm like, well, God, if I can't trust you to heal me, how can I trust you to heal anybody else? And it was a faith building exercise for me because God is not finished with us yet. God has some bigger things ahead of us than what we're in now. God has a plan for our life. And so It was a faith-building thing for me, but then I truly, truly believe that God's going to give us a ministry of healing. Now, I don't mean that I'm going to lay hands on people and they're going to fall out on Sunday morning. I don't believe that. But I do believe that God has the power to heal. And I do believe that in James 5, it says, if any among you is sick, let the elders of the church come and pray for him. And the prayer of faith save the sick. And I believe there are people that don't know Jesus yet that will come to him because somebody prayed for them to be healed. And so I believe that with all of my heart. Let me end with this. How do you know that you've asked the right question? Number one, you worship. You worship God. No matter what pain you're going through, you worship him. Number two, you show humility. You don't act like you know it all. You don't act like God owes you something, because he doesn't. Number three, you respond in faith, trusting God's promises. Whatever it is you're going through, he wants you to trust him. Number four, you surrender to God's authority. Are you for us or them? And then God changed his mind. And he said, uh, I like what that kid said, no, right? He was listening. He was listening. But I love what God did. He changed Joshua's question to, what are you saying to me, Lord? What are you trying to do in my life, Lord? And that is the right question. And then number five, you use your circumstances to serve God's purpose. 
Are you serving God's purpose with your circumstances? With your pain? With your loss? With your questions? With what you're going through? Are you serving God that way? Well, I hope you will. You see, we've got one of two ways we can approach our relationship with God. First question, are you for us or them? And what we do is we say, God, I'm doing this. I want you to bless me. I want you to get on my team. Or we can say to God, you're the commander of the armies of the Lord. And I'm not asking you to be on my team, but I sure would like to be on yours. And when we do that, God promises that he is the commander of the armies of the Lord and he will win the battle for us. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to get on your team to ask the right questions. I know you're not upset when we ask questions, God. But help us to respond like Joshua did and to worship you and to ask you to help us be on your team. Before I finish my prayer, I wonder if you would say, Pastor, I need to be saved today. I need Jesus. Whether you're online or in the room, you can pray something like this. Dear God, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That he died on the cross for my sin. That he resurrected from the grave. And I'm asking you to save me right now. If today you'll say that prayer, I want you, if you're in the room, to fill out one of the next step cards and check that you prayed to receive Christ. Online, hit the button at the bottom that you prayed to receive Christ. And then I wonder today if you'd say, Pastor, I've been asking the wrong question. My questions have really been, God, are you on my side or theirs? God, if you're on my side, why don't you show up? Why don't you change my circumstances? And I want you to pray that God will help me to start asking the right questions. If that's you today, raise your hand, and I'll pray for you. Lots of hands, lots of hands. Heavenly Father, help us today to trust you. Help us today to follow you. Help us today to ask the right questions. And Father, we pray that you'll begin to work in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.